Okay. Good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to this um, first plenary session of the final day of the Lennart Mary Conference. Um, my name is Hans Kundanani. I'm the research director at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, this is my first time at the Lennart Mary Conference, uh, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. Uh, I'm particularly excited to moderate this panel uh, on sanctions. Um, the question we've been set is um, sanctions, a sword or a boomerang? Um, which seems at a first glance like quite a simple question. Um, are sanctions effective or ineffective? Um, but I want to suggest that it's actually a rather complex um, question, uh, and in particular um, that there are at least two dimensions to this question which I'd like us um, to explore. Um, the first um, is the um, question that um, Clifford Gaddy and Barry Ikes uh, of the Brookings Institution asked, uh, which is quite simply, can sanctions stop Putin? Um, in other words, um, uh, can, um, are sanctions uh, effective, can they be effective in uh, changing uh, Russian behaviour? Um, to some extent, the uh, intention of the sanctions after the, um, the initial sanctions after the annexation of Crimea was to uh, impose costs on Russia um, for the annexation and for the uh, destabilization uh, later on of um, eastern Ukraine. Um, but clearly, the intention uh, is above all to um, change the sort of calculus of interests um, in, the, in the Kremlin, um, and as I say, to change Russian uh, behavior. Um, and so um, Gaddy and Ike distinguish in particular between uh, impact um, and effectiveness. Um, impact meaning um, you know, the impact of the sanctions, uh, for example, uh, on uh, growth in Russia, on foreign trade, on investment, uh, on income levels and so on. But that's something quite different from, um, from effectiveness uh, because our ability to impose pain on Russia uh, does not necessarily translate uh, into a change uh, of policy. Uh, and it seems to me that over the last year since the sanctions have been imposed, um, uh, the, it's looked different at different moments uh, whether the sanctions have been uh, at all uh, effective in terms of um, changing uh, Russian behavior. Um, it seems to me that the best precedent uh, we have uh, for the, um, for the, the, the um, effectiveness that sanctions might have in, in terms of changing Russian behavior um, is the case of Iran. Um, the decade of um, smart sanctions uh, that the West has, has imposed uh, on, on Iran, um, which are very different uh, from the uh, previous generation of sort of dumb sanctions, if, if you like, uh, trade sanctions above all. Um, these sanctions were conceived very differently um, uh, initially in the late 1990s, uh, and then uh, they were um, put on steroids uh, after 9-11 um, uh, as um, a, a, a book by a, a US um, Treasury uh, Department uh, official uh, put it. Um, and these sanctions were meant to, um, in particular, leverage the private sector and the integration of uh, an economy like Iran's into the, um, into the uh, international financial system. Um, now, the Iran precedent seems to me to suggest a couple of things. Um, the first is, is actually that, surprisingly, um, sanctions can be quite effective. They do seem to um, have um, brought Iran eventually to the negotiating table. Um, however, um, they also suggest that it takes rather a long time. I mean, it's been a decade um, uh, that we've um, gradually ratcheted up the sanctions uh, against Iran. And even then, it's been contingent on things like a, a change of government or change of part of the government, perhaps, I should say, uh, in Iran. Um, and secondly, I think um, that the Iran case suggests that we have quite a long way to go in relation to Russia, not just in terms of time, but in terms of the further measures that could be taken uh, against, uh, Iran, against Russia. Um, Mike Holtzel yesterday mentioned uh, the possibility of banning um, Russia from SWIFT, um, which was a, a measure that was taken in relation to Iran uh, in 2012. Um, David Cameron um, also mentioned this um, uh, uh, a couple of months ago and, and said, quote, if Russia is going to, be, is going to leave the rules-based system of the 21st century, then they need to start thinking about whether they're going to be in the 21st century system when it comes to investment, banking, uh, and clearing houses. Uh, and I think this illustrates the way that the Russian economy is vulnerable in some of the same ways as the, as the Iranian economy was, particularly because of its dependence on, on energy exports, um, and, and which, which need to be cleared in um, dollars and uh, in uh, euros, which creates a certain vulnerability. Um, 
However, the Russian economy is clearly different from the Iranian economy in many ways. It's, it's much bigger um, and it's more integrated into, uh, the, um, into the international economy, into global supply chains than the Iranian economy was. But a second difference um, uh, from the Iran case is that in the case of Iran, there wasn't a war going on uh, as there is uh, in relation to Russia now, albeit uh, one using hybrid uh, war, war techniques. Um, so I think we also need to think about the sort of complex relationship between military tools on the one hand and, and economic uh, tools uh, on the other hand and, and how linkages can be made by both sides um, uh, between these two different types of, of tools. Um, Hannah Hopko yesterday um, uh, talked about the need to, to prepare for a full-scale uh, Russian offensive um, against uh, Mariupol or even against um, Kiev. Um, but it might be also worth thinking about whether something like a, a, a ban on, uh, on Russian participation in SWIFT might actually paradoxically lead to um, uh, precisely that, that outcome. Um, that's certainly been suggested to me by, um, by Russian officials. Um, that um, brings me to the second dimension, which is um, the broader effect of uh, sanctions against Russia on, on the global economy and on the international um, uh, system. Um, because it seems to me that even if sanctions are uh, effective in stopping Putin, as um, Ikes and, and Gaddy put it, um, they could boomerang in another broader sense. Um, Shortly after the Ukraine crisis began, uh, I remember um, a British official uh, talking to me about his fear, not about the impact of sanctions on, on the city, um, uh, which was, the, which was the, the expectation or the, the way that this was um, often perceived outside of Britain, but rather the effect on the, on the World Trade Organization, um, whether actually uh, an attempt to impose sanctions uh, on Russia would destroy uh, the WTO. Um, for 20 years, uh, he said, uh, what we've essentially tried to do, not just with Russia, but also with, with China, um, is to integrate them into the international uh, system. Uh, and uh, Chinese and, and, and Russian uh, accession to the WTO was, was a triumph uh, in that sense. Um, but now, um, since the annexation of Crimea, in, in a sense, what we are, um, what we are doing is um, either exploiting Russia's integration into that international system or um, disintegrating, to some extent, Russia from, from that system. Um, which raises the question, I think, um, which, um, which Ike and Gaddy also raised, about whether we may, through sanctions, be pushing uh, Russia, in a sense, in the wrong direction, further away from uh, modernization, isolating it more, um, and uh, undermining uh, the reformers uh, in, in Russia uh, uh, more. Um, and, and finally, um, uh, could we also be um, undermined, undermining the um, liberal international order uh, as such? Um, we have presented um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the international um, system um, as a public good, um, uh, but some would allege that we are now um, weaponizing it, um, and some have even talked about um, deglobalization uh, as, a, as a consequence <coughs> of the standoff um, uh, with Russia. Uh, this came up yesterday as well, um, the emergence of, um, of parallel institutions um, uh, as alternatives to the Bretton Woods institution, um, institutions, the, um, the sanctions may be um, exacerbating or accelerating um, that process, um, in particular China and Russia uh, cooperating to develop an alternative to um, SWIFT. Um, in other words, it's complicated. Um, our fantastic panel, um, hopefully, is going to, um, is going to explain uh, all of this. Um, uh, each of them are going to speak for five to seven minutes. Um, we're going to go in the order um, that, the, uh, that, that they're listed uh, here, um, starting with um, Hendrik Hollerlei, uh, European Commission Deputy Secretary General, who's been instrumental in, um, in the development of the EU sanctions, um, followed by John uh, Heffern, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Euro European and Eurasian Affairs. Um, and a former US ambassador to Armenia who can give a US perspective. Um, then we'll get a Russian perspective from uh, Sergei Alexashenka, um, former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Russia and uh, a former Russian deputy finance minister. Uh, and then finally, uh, Anders Asland, who I think needs no uh, introduction here, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics and the author of the recently published um, Ukraine, What Went Wrong uh, and How to Fix It. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Henrik, um, why don't you kick us off and, and tell us about the thinking behind the sanctions and, and your answer to the question of whether they've been um, effective as well as, having, as well as causing pain uh, 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 to Russia. 
Well, thank you very much, um, Hans, and um, it's a great pleasure being here. And thank you very much for the, to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, if, I, if, if I may, then I just thought that um, uh, I, will, I will challenge a bit uh, the question as such. I mean, the question, are, the, are sanctions uh, effective? Because uh, it uh, invites too much of a, of, of a binary answer, either, either yes or no. Uh, it's like, like you have the title of the session, a sword or a boomerang. Uh, but um, actually, uh, the effectiveness of the sanctions should in itself be judged against their exact aim. So if you take the issue of the sword of a boomerang, then there's a kind of an implication that the sword is a superior weapon. But uh, actually, it is not necessarily the best option if you just want to do some harm, but not uh, about to kill. And on the other hand, if you take the issue of the boomerang, then that um, implies some kind of a blowback. But if that is thrown in a, in, a, in a good precision and skill, then the boomerang can also be a very effective arm. So it, it is far more mixed. And, uh, and trying to sort of um, uh, find a way out, I'd say that um, there is, it would make quite a lot of sense to, uh, to separate uh, the economic uh, effectiveness mm -hmm. also from the political effectiveness. And, uh, and in a way, you could also rephrase the question and ask, is the, is the weapon the appropriate one and has it been used with sufficient skill uh, and, and sort of trying to uh, uh, trying to distangle that from the from the wider did this help us to uh, to win the battle so so if I if I look at it from the from the economic point of view then first of all or from the economic impact point of view then uh, clearly uh, the whole policy of sanctions has evolved quite a lot um, uh, over time and uh, initially it was very much of a political signaling value and um, uh, the classical sanctions which are still used today because they happen to be effective uh, we see the uh, asset freezes visa bans and uh, and and also the arms embargoes um, uh, that have been used in the past and are still used today. And, and if you put that in the context of the, um, of the Ukrainian crisis, then you also saw that I mean, the first sanctions which were rolled out were particularly related to the visa bans and, and asset freezes, because that is the kind of a natural reaction if you, if you see that somebody has been doing something which is judged uh, illegal or unacceptable, then the uh, international community is, 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 is responding to that, then that is, that is what you usually do. The, the so-called uh, targeted uh, economic pressure on certain sectors, which actually can be much more effective and, and also affecting the calculus itself uh, to the specific political re leader or regime, was, uh, was actually developed further on. And, uh, and then that has, that has been used uh, again in the number of cases, but again evolving over time. I think, Hans, you made a, you made a very good and very, very correct reference also uh, to, the, um, to the case of Iran. I mean, until now, this is definitely the most sophisticated uh, economic sanctions regime that we have had in place. But, uh, but now, when we talk about uh, the case of, uh, or when we talk about Ukrainian crisis and the sanctions against Russia, then it, uh, the, uh, it, it has been, the, uh, it, it it has been uh, brought to the new level and, and it has even uh, been labeled as surgical sanctions because they, are much, they, are, they, they have much more precision and, and they are far more sophisticated. And, and that also clearly shows, and that was very much of our experience, that if you want to be effective, then uh, uh, it all has to be based on a very thorough uh, economic analysis and, uh, and taking into account the different elements, the dependencies and vulnerabilities, for example, also the risk of uh, circumvention, the risk of substitution, enforceability. So it is actually... Uh, it is actually quite a lot of different variables which, which are there in that game. And when we were embarking on that road, once the political leaders gave us the, the task to do so, uh, the further we went in our preparations, the more we realized how, okay. how complicated it is and how many different factors you have to take into account. And, and of course, in the case of the, of the EU, there is also the specific aspect that you have 28 member states to have to agree, because, uh, because this is a decision which is taken by unanimity. And, and that would, of course, mean that you have to do the trade I mean, you don't end up having the most ideal and the most effective uh, set of sanctions. What you end up is that this is, is how to sort of uh, have this kind of uh, effective set of sanctions, but at the same time also taking into account uh, the red lines of, of quite a number of member states, because without that, you simply would not have a sanction regime in place. So, so that is a part of the economic impact. If we look at the uh, political impact, then 
uh, it is, it's very useful to, uh, to look at it, and it's a necessary exercise, but it can never be a conclusive one. So uh, there is no uh, counterfactual to, to tell us how, in a given situation, how a given situation would have evolved if uh, the sanctions would not have been there. Yeah. And, uh, and again, uh, if we want to put that in the, in the Ukraine uh, crisis context, uh, whether the, uh, uh, the Minsk II as such would have, would have actually materialized, uh, uh, again, if, uh, if there would have been no sanctions in place, or even the Minsk I. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite clear. Because, uh, because what we have also seen that is that uh, when there is also a talk of adding a potentially a new layer of sanctions on the top, then uh, you also see that there is much more willingness uh, from one side uh, to, uh, to actually um, sit behind the table and, uh, and at least, you know, to have the, the process as such. So, so that also shows that uh, the sanctions cannot be looked at uh, uh, in isolation mm -hmm. and uh, they, are, they are part of a wider policy mix. I mean, I always said and I strongly believe that uh, this, is, this is just one tool in the toolbox and, uh, yeah. and the toolbox has all kinds of things. I mean, combining sticks and carrots and, uh, and also diplomacy and pressure with uh, different modulations and also the timing. So if you and look military, now... And military tools. And absolutely, absolutely. If you look, I mean, again, uh, what kind of sanctions have been effective and, uh, and, and, and how they have contributed to a policy change, you could, you could say that, um, of course, the, uh, the one in, in, in South, uh, against South Africa in terms of the apartheid regime, uh, you could also say that it has helped actually uh, to, uh, to go further or, or in relation to the Kimberley process. I mean, these are the kind of examples that you would come across. But also, uh, in, and at least today, many would say that it is, it's also true in, in case of Iran. I mean, it's also quite interesting to see how the evaluation of the existence of sanctions actually changes over time. Yeah. Because there you see that, look, if you take Iran, for example, I mean, most of the newspaper articles until recent few months, uh, they were relatively negative about the effect of the sanctions. Now, yeah. having the, uh, the pre-deal, so to say, now in, yeah. in, in Lausanne before the Easter, yeah. you actually see that uh, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, different mm -hmm. kind of of, of evaluation now to say, well, actually, it is because of the sanctions then, uh, yeah. that, that, that we have this, uh, uh, this process that far as it is and, and most likely to come to its conclusion in June. So, um, so that's definitely something which, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which has to be taken into account as well as the involvement over time of the, of, the, of the assessment how the sanctions work. Now, if I may just quickly also, in terms of the uh, EU uh, and Russia context, and, and, and trying to, to, to give you my perspective in this, in, in this sense. Now, have the uh, economic uh, sanctions been effective? And, uh, I'd, I dare to say, and of course uh, to be challenged by, uh, by anybody else, that uh, the economic sanctions have definitely been effective if you take uh, into account uh, what kind of aim are you evaluating against it. So, for example, um, the aim that the Russian incursion uh, to Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea uh, is to be made so much more expensive for Russia for that, the economic sanctions have definitely contributed. I mean, I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with, uh, with the statistics that, uh, that, that, that you have all, all heard and can easily find from, from internet, but, but I mean, the, uh, the, the perspective of the, of the fall of the, of the Russian uh, GDP, the, uh, the outflow of capital and so on, I mean, this is clearly there. Now, the skeptics would say, yeah, but okay, this is because of the uh, fall of the oil prices and so on. It, uh, of course, and that's, that, that's the thing, that there are many elements which start to uh, come together. The effect of the, uh, of the uh, fall of the oil prices would have never been the same of, to, uh, to the Russian economy if the sanctions would have been in place and vice versa. Yeah. Actually, for me, there are, there are three elements which I, which are, which I tend to uh, uh, build on. First is that, and which have contributed to the situation we have actually seen, and which we partly can also attribute to the effectiveness of the sanctions. First, the fact that the Russian economy already before uh, the, uh, the crisis started, the Russian economy had not been modernized, had, had already grave difficulties as such anyway. Secondly, of course, we have the economic sanctions, and in particular, in terms of short term, we have had a very, uh, very I'd say, quite very effective sanctions in the, in, the, in the sector of financial services, which has hit hardest, at least in the short term, even though in the long term, definitely some of the bans on the imports of sensitive technologies is already, we can see, will be, will be affecting the Russian capabilities of uh, drilling oil and gas, especially from the Arctic and from the deep sea. And of course, the third element has been the, uh, the, the 
fall of the of the oil prices. And yep. none of those elements separately wouldn't have contributed to the outcome that, that, that we are seeing today. So for that purpose, yes, I'd say the economic sanctions have been effective. Now, but the, are, are they leading to a, are they moderating Russian behavior? Well, again, that is the question which, which, I, which I, in a way, tried to, tried to already uh, refer to earlier, to say that, well, would have we have had the Minsk II? Would we have even had the Minsk I if right. there wouldn't have been the threat of the sanctions? Yep. And yes, uh, there is certainly, if we talk about the uh, respecting the territorial integrity of Ukraine and stopping helping the separatists in the eastern Ukraine, then yes, we have not seen that happening today. But, uh, but, but, but again, we are still early days. I mean, the sanctions have, have been in place uh, since the uh, beginning of August last year. And, not, and that's just, uh, I mean, even less than a year. I mean, it's just slightly more than half a year. And to, yeah do a very uh, far-reaching analysis after six months on the effect of the sanctions, yep. I mean, it would not be simply appropriate. Yep. But, but, but then, yes, I mean, the political aim as such, what we wanted to see, a change of policy, this, until <laughs> now, has not been achieved. And, uh, and, and maybe three points I just leave here yep. so that, that we can come back. I mean, there are also kind of, I would say, uh, you can also look beyond the political effectiveness and, uh, and, and also what else the sanctions have actually contributed to. I mean, first, the showcase of European unity. I mean, Europe has been very proud that it has remained united throughout the uh, crisis at, uh, in its decisions. It has also taken decision on the sanctions. It has also maintained it. And most likely, uh, it will also take a decision to extend the sanctions until uh, the end of the year uh, in June. Uh, at, at least that was agreed when the leaders last time met. So, so, so really, I mean, uh, this is not something which has to be taken for granted. I think some of the third countries never thought that the EU can be united on such a, su su such a complicated issue and maintain the unity. So, so this, has, this has been definitely a very positive display. The other element is also the, um, that the sanctions can harness international uh, cooperation and, uh, and solidarity. I mean, it has, it has also intensified a lot the cooperation in the context of the G7. The G7 countries are, are cooperating in trying to make sure that uh, any of the sanctions regimes is, is known uh, to each other. They are not, uh, they are not uh, uh, exactly the same, but they are complementing each other, and, and all the sides are very well aware what, what's happening, and that, uh, that includes in particular then the, the, the cooperation between the EU, uh, United States, Canada, and, uh, and Japan, and, and this is on a new level that it wasn't there before, and the whole sanctions process has definitely contributed to that. And of course, uh, thirdly, just to say that sanctions offer an opportunity also to reassess um, its own policy choices and, and interest. And, uh, and that, that means, of course, um, uh, that uh, the assessment uh, goes into the design of the measures that uh, require measuring all the ramifications of the relation with that third country and put that in a much wider context. We know much more today, for example, about uh, the country against whom the sanctions were introduced, but we also know much more about the weaknesses which some of the member states in EU have in relation to these sanctions, which we wouldn't have had before. So, so just to sort of add that on the, on the, on, on the general uh, uh, discussion. Great, thank you. Um, just before I turn to John, could you just say a, a word or two about um, how you see this developing in the next six months or, or, or a year? Um, you seem to suggest um, that the most likely outcome is that the EU rolls over the existing sanctions. I assume that's based on an assumption <coughs> that, that the situation on the ground doesn't change very much in Ukraine, either for the better or for the worse. Um, but can you imagine a situation in which further sanctions uh, are imposed? Um, and if so, what might they be? As, as I say, Cameron mentioned SWIFT, which is kind of the nuclear option, but there's a whole bunch of other steps that could be taken in between what we currently have and, and excluding Russia from SWIFT. What's the thinking um, about further steps that could be taken? Well, um, concerning the rollover of the, of the sanctions, I mean, this has been already part of the agreed uh, EU policy, even though the decision itself has not been made. Uh, the heads of state and government uh, at the summit have, have clearly indicated that they are intent to do so, and they intend to link the, uh, the sanctions uh, to the implementation of the, of the Minsk, Minsk, and then that would automatically mean mm -hmm. that uh, the extension should be until the end of the year. Now, everything is only decided once the decision as such is made, but I think it's plausible at this stage to expect that to happen. Uh, now, um, concerning uh, 
what kind of uh, sanctions, I think we are talking about the sanctions which currently exist. I mean, the part of the sanctions policy always is the issue of scalability. I mean, you have the possibility of making the sanctions stronger. Mm -hmm. You also have the possibility to make the sanctions weaker. And if there is a very clear uh, political uh, decision to say that we have to scale back now, <coughs> then that is also possible. The system we have in place also allows us to start rolling back the sanctions if, if, if that's what is the outcome. This is what we see also today in the context of Iran. I mean, there are going to be different stages. I mean, the first one, most likely, once the deal is reached, is related to the financial services, and the last ones, which will be rolled back when we are not only having the deal, but also to make sure that uh, the deal is implemented, is related to the cooperation in the in the in the nuclear fields, for example. So, so you can apply the same logic, and the same logic is already built into the system in the, in case of the Russia sanctions. So, um, so, uh, and but but concerning uh, whatever is new, again, I mean, we have no uh, uh, political. Uh, um, decision that, 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 that the new set of sanctions will be, uh, will be, will be uh, put on the table for the moment. Uh, uh, the situation on the ground is, is, is volatile, but uh, this definitely has de-escalated from the, from the peak of the, of, the, of the military activity. And, uh, and, and for that purpose, I, I don't really uh, see that, uh, that the political leaders will be in a position <coughs> to suggest that we should uh, add new layer of sanctions, rather to make sure that the existing sanctions, which do have the economic effect, will uh, continue to be applied. Great. Thank you, Henrik. Um, John, um, the EU and the US have actually been remarkably united over the last um, year or so in terms of imposing sanctions in a very coordinated way. There's been perhaps slight differences of emphases in terms of perceptions and, and, and different, slightly different economic strategic interests, perhaps. Um, and there's been a few bumpy sort of moments along, along the, the way, but, but nevertheless, actually quite Absolutely. remarkable unity. Um, could you speak to some of what Henrik said and, and, and tell us about perhaps the slight differences in the way that the US um, perceives the, 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 the um, effectiveness of sanctions, the, the role of sanctions in relation to, to other tools. Well, Hans, Hans thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Dan Freed uh, uh, regrets very much that he couldn't be here. He has a family emergency. He's a very senior uh, diplomat who is running our sanctions policy, works with Henry very closely, and I do think that it's a great example of transatlantic uh, unity and cooperation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Mr. President, thank you for your leadership and for Estonia's hospitality to all of us, uh, all of us this weekend. Uh, the one thing I learned at NATO from my military colleagues was when you have a, a discussion about an issue like this, you should start with your mission statement. What are we trying to do? And our mission statement on, in, in Europe is one you've heard a thousand times, uh, to promote and advance a Europe that's whole and free and at peace. And it's well known, uh, but I think it bears repeating, especially in the current, uh, in the current crisis. And uh, there are many threats. Uh, we've talked a lot about different threats to that mission uh, the last couple of days. Uh, but I think, and certainly uh, Washington thinks, the European Bureau thinks, the biggest challenge, the biggest threat to that mission statement is the Russian aggression. Uh, in Ukraine, and that's what we are talking about uh, today, and, and there was a very interesting discussion about that yesterday. Our U.S. has four lines of effort uh, in, the, uh, in the current crisis, uh, and I will get to sanctions in a second, but let me just start a little more broadly, Hans, if I might. The first line of effort is to raise the cost, raise the cost to Moscow, increase the cost to Moscow. Uh, to Russia for its aggression, and its aggre the impact of its aggression is well known. More than 6,000 dead, more than a million displaced, uh, uh, horrific violence uh, perpetrated by Russia and the separatists. And, and, and the purpose is very explicitly uh, impact, not necessarily effectiveness, but impact, uh, to raise the cost to Moscow for this, uh, for this, uh, this aggression. The second line of effort uh, is to help Ukraine, of course, is to help Ukraine uh, on its reform path. Clearly, they've taken some very important political and economic reforms. I don't think, frankly, some Europeans give them enough credit for what they've done uh, under the worst possible circumstances. Uh, so to help them on their reform path, but also Ukraine obviously has the right to defend itself uh, and help them uh, in, their, uh, in their defense. The third line of effort is to reinforce our allies. A couple days ago, I would have said reassure, but since I've been in the Baltics, uh, I've learned that the word reassure is not the best word. Uh, the Balts say, we're not the problem. We don't need to be reassured. You know, the other guys need to be deterred. So I'll say reinforce the allies. Uh, 
uh, and, and, and for the purpose of, of deterring, uh, deterring uh, Russia from, from any more adventurism, uh, certainly in this neighborhood and elsewhere. Uh, Frontline states, we use that term in Washington a lot now. A couple of years ago when I was in Washington, we never used the word term frontline states, not in the context of Europe anyway, but that word is very much back uh, in, uh, in, in all of our meetings. So the third line of, line of effort is to reinforce the alliance and reinforce allies. General Hodges was here and spoke to all of you with, in great detail about what NATO and the United States are doing uh, in this area, the goal of which is to deter uh, Moscow from taking any, uh, any steps uh, in this region. And then the fourth, and this is where you get to the, the effectiveness point, we want to maintain an off-ramp, some kind of a line to Russia, some kind of an off-ramp in the event, we haven't seen any evidence of it yet, but in the event that Moscow does choose uh, a path of de-escalation and, 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 and meaningful, meaningful withdrawal. Obviously, we want to make that uh, possible. We don't want to take steps they're going to make that uh, a good choice, a good decision by uh, Mr. Putin. We don't want to make that impossible. So now to sanctions. Uh, sanctions are obviously key to this entire effort. And the fact that they're coordinated, joint, international sanctions is really, is really critical. And we want to thank the European uh, Union for its leadership here and, and, and all the uh, European allies and partners uh, for uh, solidarity and support for U.S. And, and EU sanctions, whether you're members of the EU or not. I know a lot of you uh, are, are honoring the sanctions even of organizations of which you're not uh, a part. These sanctions really are key to increasing the cost uh, to Moscow uh, for its aggression and also for uh, the long-term goal of restoring to Ukraine uh, its sovereignty and territorial, and territorial integrity, which obviously includes uh, Crimea. The, the impact, and we've talked about that, I mean, the, so we have what? We have trade down, we have uh, ruble down, we have uh, GDP down, uh, food, food prices up. So I think the impact on, on Russia is clear. Uh, the effectiveness, as you said, Hans, is the, is, the bigger, is the bigger question. Now, I would say just briefly that, that if, and it's certainly true in the Baltic countries here, that the, the sanctions and the counter sanctions have had, uh, have brought hardships to some of our uh, sectors and some of our people, agriculture particularly. Uh, but the sanctions, again, are, are joint, it's put joint and combined pressure on Moscow that really is essential. Uh, Washington does welcome the decision in March that uh, Henrik talked about, the decision in March to uh, pledge to roll over the sanctions to the end of the year uh, in the event that Minsk is implemented. And we don't like the term Minsk 1 and 2, Henrik. I'll just take difference with you there. I know. Uh, to us, the commitments are the September commitments, and February was a way station, uh, implementation phase for what uh, Russia committed to do uh, in September. Uh, so, so R Russia is not complying. I mean, it's obviously Russia and the uh, separatists are not complying. Uh, and Moscow has a choice that if it continues to refuse to comply with its commitments uh, and continues its aggressive action uh, in, in Ukraine, the, there will be consequences. The cost will increase. The further measures will be taken. Pressure will increase. There's no question about that. Uh, and in that regard, we continue to call on Moscow to uh, and its occupation of Crimea, which is clearly uh, what triggered uh, a two-step sanctions process, which I'll talk about in a second. So now let's talk about the off-ramp for a minute. It is, it is theoretically possible that Russia could choose uh, to implement its commitments. It could, uh, it could grant access to the OSC monitors. It could withdraw the weapons, withdraw the troops, uh, have a real ceasefire in the violations, release the hostages. There's a whole, Rus Russia knows what to do. If it wants to end the sanctions, it knows what it needs to do. Uh, but there, there was a question yesterday in the Ukraine session about whether, is it just Minsk or is it also Crimea? Well, as Henrik mentioned, there are two sets of, of sanctions. One that was instituted after the Crimea uh, uh, invasion and occupation. Uh, and then a second set, uh, broad sets. There were little ones along the way, but two broad sets of sanctions. Uh, and the, the, the sanctions that are related to the Crimean occupation would not be uh, eased, uh, even if Russia does all the right stuff in the Donbass. Uh, there will be, Russia will have to do the right thing in Crimea uh, to get those sanctions uh, eased as well. 
So uh, the conditions uh, are for rolling back the sanctions are well known, uh, restoring to Kiev its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, and we will continue to judge uh, Moscow by its actions, not by its words. Uh, and we're still uh, working very closely with uh, European partners uh, to, to in the four lines of effort that I've talked about. So sanctions are certainly not a cure-all. They're not going to solve this crisis by, by themselves. But we think uh, that, that it's a really important sanctions are a really important uh, a part of the toolkit uh, in the list of that uh, we talked earlier about, Hans mentioned, political, diplomatic, economic, uh, and defense military uh, tools to resolve this uh, current crisis that we face. So again, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Again, uh, Dan Fried has many friends here today, and he really was sorry that he couldn't be with you today. Great. Thank you, uh, John. Um, I'd love to hear more about, um, about the US perception of the relationship between the different sets of tools, and in particular between the economic and military ones. And I'm thinking particularly of that moment during the, when there was a fairly intensive debate going on in the US about supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine. And then the, well, some Europeans immediately ruled that out in advance. And, and so I'd love to hear more about whether you think that Europeans perhaps place too much emphasis on the economic sanctions and think that they alone can solve the problem. But perhaps we can come back to that, because I'm conscious of the time. And I want to bring the audience in as soon as possible as well. Um, Sergey, um, how does this look um, from, a, a, from a, a Russian perspective? How resilient is the Russian economy? Um, how much impact is the, um, it, are the sanctions having? Uh, and, and what's your perception of, of um, the likelihood um, that they could at some point um, lead to a change in Russian policy as well as causing pain? Okay, thank you. First of all, I have to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference. I'm first time in the Latin American conference, though it's not my first time in Tallinn, of course. I have been here dozens of times since the Soviet Union, since my childhood. I'm really impressed by this conference and by the discussions I listen. Uh, on sanctions, sanctions do work. They do have impact. And it will be funny to argue this. Uh, even if we put aside everything and we say, okay, there is a ban on refinancing of foreign debt for Russian banks and companies imposed on state-controlled banks, but nevertheless it's, it covers all banks and companies. They are not able to raise uh, financing in the capital markets. Uh, in, uh, in 2015, Russian corporates have to refinance $120 billion of foreign debt. Let's imagine one third of this is friendly debt, affiliated debt. It's not real. Let's imagine. $80 billion should be refinanced. And the Russian economy has no ability to refinance in the capital markets. $80 billion uh, is approximately 5% of Russian GDP for the coming year. Does, is it impact? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. And we cannot argue that any economy that has to pay out 5% of its GDP as the debt repayment is a consequence, is in impact, and it affects the economy. We cannot measure it in GDP growth. How it will cause, will it be minus 0.5 of GDP or 0.7 or maybe 1.2? We cannot measure it, but definitely it will be impact. But we have to remember that this impact will go down. In 2016, the overall repayment is only 70 billion. Once again, one third is friendly debt. That means 45 billion. 45 billion is only 3% of Russian GDP. In 2017, it will be even less. Mm -hmm. So we should not overestimate the pressure of financial sanctions. And we should not say, OK, even if Russia is not following its commitments on Minsk agreement, the pressure will, go, uh, will increase because of uh, sanctions will not be removed. No, the pressure will go down. Uh, oil sanctions, they are more, uh, more of uh, a fun, more of a fun because on the one hand, they do affect Russian economy. And uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Hlaponin said that approximately 800 oil fields, oil deposits, uh, are under sanctions. They are not able to raise finance, and that's why there is a postponement in exploration so far. But nevertheless, in December last year, Russia hit a record high in oil exploration, in oil production, historical. In March, it was even higher. So despite all sanctions, financial sanctions and oil sanctions, Russian oil industry is able to produce more oil than ever before. Uh, could, uh, could, uh, Russian, uh, could, could sanctions be, uh, not provide impact, but as you say, could they be effective? Uh, on Iranian sanctions, I, I, I listen very carefully, very, very attentively to the SWIFT debates. It seems to me there is misunderstanding about SWIFT. SWIFT is a mobile telecommunication. 
But except of mobile, you have fixed lines. Can we live without mobiles? Yes, we can. It's not easy. It's not as comfortable. But we can survive. If banks have no access to SWIFT, they can use Telex, they can use fax, they can use phone lines. It will be more expensive, it will be more slow, you, you will de facto have no access to capital markets, and it will impact a lot of new costs on American banks and European banks who hold their correspondent accounts. But nevertheless, economy and banks can survive. The most, uh, the most severe in uh, Iranian sanctions, it seems to me, it was freeze of assets of Iranian banks imposed in 2008, and what is more important, freeze of assets of the Central Bank of Iran in 2012. That's really a disaster for any economy. Because if you cancel Iranian banks or Russian banks, even from, from SWIFT, okay, they can do it via Chinese banks, via Hong Kong banks, via Nauru banks, and so on and so far. But if you freeze assets of the banks, if you freeze assets of a commercial bank, of central bank of Russia, that's a disaster. And that put Iran to negotiate about nukes. Uh, to my mind, I, I'm not a diplomat. And so uh, what I say further may be not very diplomatic, uh, and uh, I uh, won't excuse me, but it seems to me sanctions were never uh, designed to make effect. They were about costs on Russia, but they were not about effect. Uh, san uh, as I, 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 on one of the previous sessions, I said there was hard power and soft power. Conflict in Ukraine is about hard power on the Russian side. And you cannot stop hard power by trying to use soft power. At least sanctions is soft power and very soft, 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 soft power. Surely, yes. e surely economic sanctions are a form of hard power? Sorry? Are, are economic sanctions not a form of hard power? No. No, they, they, they <laughs> look, look. They're, co the, they're coercive. Uh, they, they're coercive, definitely. But the, 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 if it's, it's, imp it's about impact. Do they cause a fall of the ruble? Yes, they do, without, with, uh, together with oil price collapse. Do they cause in high inflation? Yes. Do they harm budget process? Yes. But do they affect economic policy of Mr. Putin? Yes. But it will take, I don't know, two, three, four, five years. Russian economy will not burn out in one year. Yeah. It's, it's stupid to say this. No. Yeah. It will survive. It's too stable. Export of all raw materials of oil is, in going, is increasing. Russian economy has two pillars. One is natural resources, another is military complex. Yeah. Russian military production uh, is growing 20% year to year, yeah. and that is half, half of the manufacturing of Russian economy, if you deduct from uh, metals uh, from, from the manufacturing. Yeah. That's, that's the engine of the Russian economy. Yeah. The decline of GDP in the first quarter was only 2%. It's not, it's not 10, it's not 11, like it was in 2008, 2009. It's, it's minor. Uh, uh, I, I wonder why sanctions were not imposed on Gazprom. Gazprom is definitely one of the instruments of Russia on European sanctions. There, there are American sanctions, but there are no European sanctions on Gazprom. Gazprom is definitely one of the weapons of Russia in hybrid war against Ukraine. Yeah. Moreover, I believe that all LNG projects of Gazprom, they harm European economy. They harm European gas market. So why? Why sanctions were not imposed on relatives of people who are in the sanction, in the visa bans and freezing of assets? Do you really believe that as Europeans have frozen 35 million dollars of assets of Mr. Rottenberg, is the only one person who lost his personal assets? Is real harm on uh, Putin's cronies? No. Why, why sanctions were not imposed on Russia today, on First Channel, on Russia TV channel? That are weapons of Russia in this hybrid war and they are not under sanctions. That means it's not, it's not about effect. It's about costs. About costs, I do not like. There are costs, and they are. And uh, the, very, the very last phrase I would like to say, I, I really do not believe we should estimate that any sanctions we could design will result in immediate impact of Putin's policy. I agree with what Natalia Givarkan said yesterday and repeated several times. Putin believes he is a messiah. For many years, he believes he is given by Lord to Russia, and all his decision is correct. All he does, he does in favor of Russia future, yeah. prosperous Russia future. Yeah. And I, I really do not believe that he is afraid of sanctions. He is ready to resist, but sanctions may increase costs for Russian population, yeah. and that will reduce his support. 
It's a long run game. Yeah. It's a long run game. And we should not say that any list of sanctions will change Russian policy immediately. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. So, so um, uh, we're in this for the long haul, um, somewhat like Iran, perhaps. Um, uh, sanctions, uh, the Russian economy is perhaps more resilient than, than, we, than we think. Um, uh, and the, effects, the, the, the effect of, of sanctions is, is diminishing, you're, you're suggesting, as, as well over, over time. Um, could you just, though, before we, before we turn to Anders, um, address the, the point about the, 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 the way that the sanctions, which direction, in a sense, they're, they're pushing the Russian economy in? Do you share the, the worry that actually they're pushing the Russian economy in precisely the wrong di direction? You mentioned the um, military production as, as the engine of Russian growth. I mean, are we, are we creating a, a much less liberal Russian economy that focuses on things like, um, on, on things like arms production um, more than it used to, that's becoming, as I say, less liberal in general? Is that a fear you share? Mm, I cannot call Russian economy liberal in general. And so it's, uh, it's very difficult to measure it's more liberal or less liberal. It's not liberal at all. But nevertheless, policy can have an impact. It's a very good question. It's a very good question about how the sanctions in, impact Russian economic policy. I would say that uh, sanctions are very important because they, they enforce uh, Putin and his team to make mistakes. Yeah, that's, that, that's what's going on. Yeah. For example, I believe that all what was done uh, uh, with uh, a ban on the food uh, import to Russia is uh, definitely a harm for Russian exactly. economy. Yes, there is a cost, there is a boomerang for Europeans. Definitely Europeans, uh, European farmers and producers, they lost something. But definitely it was a much stronger impact on what's going on in Russia in inflation terms, in households' moods. Uh, in the current, in the last maybe six to eight weeks, there are huge rumors in Russia about import substitution. So. Putin yeah. believes that he anticipates that sanctions will go on, that he will not give back uh, Donbass, that it will be a frozen conflict for a long yeah. time, and definitely he will not give back Crimea. It's, forget about this. And Crimean sanctions are very weak and very loose. He can survive for, for, the, for, for centuries. But he believes, OK, you may impose new sanctions, and we will isolate our economy. We will invest huge trillions of Russian budgetary <laughs> money to replace, uh, to re substitute import to here, there, and there, hundreds of projects. And that, that's, of course, uh, any, any import substitution policy uh, will result in decreasing efficiency of the economy. Yeah. It will be a huge cost. That's, that's a mistake. Yeah? And if, if, uh, if you ask in the beginning, is it going for isolation, disintegration of Russia, it's Putin. Putin is doing this, not sanctions. Yeah. It's yeah. not about sanctions. It's his desire to isolate Russia. But I wonder. Does Russia produce anything sensible, any, uh, any valuable for, for the rest of the economy except of oil and gas? Oil and gas are and natural weapons. resources. Russia will sell it one way or another. Yeah. But on the, on, the, on the sanctions, sanctions make Putin to make mistake. Yeah, great. Very interesting. Um, Anders, um, uh, you followed the Russian economy and Eastern European economies for a very long time. Give us a sense of, from your perspective, how, what's changed in the last year and, and how you see this developing in future. How resilient, again, is the Russian economy um, and how effective are the sanctions? Thank you very much. And first of all, I want to say how happy I'm here to be here at the Lennart Miri conference once again. And we congratulate the organizers to every year doing ever better, and particularly to thank uh, President Ilves for his active participation in this uh, discussion. Uh, my view, uh, Sergei and I discuss this uh, all the time, uh, so we know each other very well. My view of the Russian economy in comparison with Sergei is that it's uh, in a far worse shape. It's much more vulnerable, and it will be hurt more by the sanctions. So I will elaborate upon this, while my view, policy view on sanctions is very similar uh, to, to Sergei's. So what we are seeing now is a totally mismanaged economy. And economic policy takes out its right. We don't know how fast, but it will come. The fundamental issue is that uh, Russia is a kleptocracy, as Karen Darwisha uh, so aptly has put it in her outstanding book, Putin's Kleptocracy, which is not allowed to sell in Europe because of the British uh, libel laws, which <laughs> is just outrageous. Europe needs more uh, freedom uh, of print. Uh, and uh, it, it is based to a considerable extent on the excellent uh, 
uh, booklets about Vladimir Milov and uh, Boris Nemtsov, uh, Putin and Gazprom, uh, and Putin uh, uh, results. And the second problem is the oil prices. So the oil prices have hit Russia hard and means on their own that Russia's imports will fall by half. To, to your first question here about the impact on the outside world of the sanctions, it's the oil price that is important. And the sanctions are not at all uh, that important. And uh, the third big effect is the financial sanctions. The other sanctions are not economically very important, but the financial sanctions are, as we've already heard, uh, enormously important. And uh, to give you a few numbers, Russia's GDP used to be $2.1 trillion a year ago at current exchange rates. Today, it's $1.2 trillion. It's one and a half percent of global GDP. It's around Spain or South Korea. I'm not talking purchasing power parities here. I'm talking uh, real exchange rates. That's what ma matters in uh, global finance. That's what matters for the financial uh, sanctions. So Russia is far too weak economically to be so adventurous. Of course, you can turn it around, but if you're so weak uh, economically, then you do become adventurous. So th this is the other side, uh, uh, side of, uh, of the coin. And um, it has already been discussed here a bit, but the financial sanctions have been far more effective than anybody expected. And the reason is uh, a combination of uh, the US financial regulators, that hit BNP Paribas with $9 billion of fine. <coughs> yeah. And uh, the other side of it uh, is um, uh, the internal compliance officers in uh, banks. If you talk to investment bankers today who do any work on Eastern Europe, they complain that they have to spend two hours a day with a compliance officer that they can't stand. <laughs> And this means that they don't want to do any business with Russia if they can avoid it. It's unpleasant. And the uh, financial effect of this is uh, that about $10 billion goes out of Russia each month net. And uh, uh, Russia's uh, reserves fell indeed by $125 billion this last year, so far $35 billion this year in uh, three and a half months, and it's just continuing. And this will get, uh, uh, put Russia in a liquidity uh, squeeze, I argue, late this year. And the reason Bet. is, I don't make bets. Bet. I don't make bets, <laughs> I just speak. <clears throat> and um, the reason is that Russia officially has $350 billion of international reserves. In fact, only 150 of these uh, uh, billion uh, are uh, liquid and with the central bank. $150 billion is held by the Minister of Finance and should not be included in the reserves. Many countries do not include that in the reserve, uh, and uh, that will be used up uh, by the budget. And at the same time, Russia has $570 billion of foreign debt, both private and uh, public, and $570 billion against $150 billion in reserves does not look good. That means a financial squeeze, and it's easily predictable. This is sheer and simple arithmetic, and this is nonlinear. The tighter it gets, the harder the, the effects. So this is uh, what uh, Sergei and I uh, always argue about. So uh, I know the counter arguments. And uh, then uh, we, we come to the question, are uh, sanctions politically effective? Yeah. And by and large, I disagreed with the points you made here early on, on uh, 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 Gadi. And I would say that it's a reverse causality. Uh, it's not uh, in the direction they argue. Uh, there is an excellent book done by my uh, colleagues, um, Gary Huffbauer, Jeffrey Schott, and Kim Bailey on the effectiveness of, uh, empirical effectiveness of sanctions after the Second World War, Western sanctions against various countries. And uh, uh, there are a lot of conclusions in that book. 30% uh, 
of sanctions succeed. So most sanctions do not succeed. Uh, but sanctions are rarely effective in the short term. They are effective in the long term, where Iran is a wonderful example. Yeah. And um, uh, sanctions are more likely to be successful if they are narrow. So therefore, it's good to have specified what is for Crimea and what is for Donbass, rather than saying we can't do anything if we uh, Russians don't give up uh, uh, everything. And uh, they are more effective when they are broad, which means that it's very important that the uh, US and the EU act together. You can say that it's really the US that rules the US dollar that imposes the important yeah. financial sanctions, but it would be politically difficult to, to maintain them if the, the European Union did not impose approximately uh, the same. So I think that the financial sanctions will be very effective, far more effective than we realize. And the question is what uh, the scared red Mr. Putin will do when yes. he realizes what a trap he has ended up in. Yeah, great, thank you. So, so, um, so it's interesting, you, you disagree with Sergei about the, um, about the impact, that the, the economic impact that the sanctions are gonna have. You think it's gonna be much more extreme, it's unpredictable, it's non-linear. Um, but, um, but you um, agree that, um, that actually the political impact um, is, is problematic. You suggested at one point that um, the weaker the Russian economy becomes, the more adventurous Putin um, uh, is likely to become. Well, the outstanding example is that uh, uh, it's argued that the Japanese uh, attacked Pearl Harbor because their economy was in such a poor state. If you re have a big military power and little financial power, you use the military power before uh, you, you lose out because of your uh, weakness. But I think that uh, Sergei made a very good point that Gazprom should be sanctioned. Yeah. Admittedly, I think that it should be prosecuted for money laundering because this mm -hmm. is the main money laundering machine in yeah. the world and it's incomprehensible why it's not sanctioned. Interesting you raised Pearl Harbor because Francois Isborg mentioned that yesterday as one of the sort of unpredictables. Yeah. Um, but let me, before I open it out to the audience, give um, Henrik a chance just to respond, particularly on the, on the, the there are a, a number of possible uh, targets for sanctions that were mentioned. Um, why have Gazprom and Russia today and so on not being sanctioned. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the Gazprom and Russia today, I, I, I wanted to come in anyway. I think I, I, I partly already uh, gave the answer in my earlier introduction, but uh, happy to re-emphasize again. I mean, as I said, the, the set of sanctions that is in place is, is not something which is the best of the best. I mean, it is just what was possible to agree within the 28, and, and also you had to make a number of compromises in order to achieve the set that is currently in force. And, uh, and part of that was also that in order to uh, be able to have the agreement of 28 uh, uh, at, at, at the present stage, uh, the intention is not to sanction the gas sector in Russia, also taking into account the specific dependency that, that, that Europe still has, even though it is, it is diminishing in the, over the longer run. But at the moment, uh, that was very clear that uh, it will be very difficult to agree in EU on any of the sanctions on the gas sector. But I don't want to only, uh, only limit that to the EU, for example. Uh, whenever any discussion about the gas sector comes up, then, for example, our Japanese friends also become very agitated about it and make it very clear that that is not something which would also be in their interest. So, so that's how you, you sort of find the balance. On the Russia today, I mean, there is a general uh, sentiment that uh, um, even though you might want to define it in different ways, that, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but the general sentiment is uh, not to sanction the media outlets. And, uh, and I think that is something which, uh, which is quite widely shared in, uh, among different member states. And, and, and that's why it is simply a road uh, that uh, is not worthwhile to take because you don't get anywhere. You just, uh, uh, you just uh, uh, spend a lot of time and effort, but, but you know already before and that it wouldn't yield into, into any kind of effective sanctions. Yeah. Just wanted quick, uh, two quick points which also came up. I very much wanted to echo also what, what Anders said about the, um, uh, uh, the financial sector and, and in particular also the issue about the bank lending. Uh, what we witnessed very early days when we introduced the financial sanctions was the overcompliance actually what we had in the financial sector. Mm -hmm precisely for the reasons that, that you described. Uh, financial institutions were so much scared that something might go wrong and, and, and the compliance was so tough 
that uh, it was easier for them uh, even not to lend money to, to, to those financial institutions which were not directly sanctioned but uh, just to avoid having afterwards uh, to be to be sanctioned by sanctioned by the by the EU or US courts for example so so and, and that is still there even though you can see that there is a little bit more liquidity in principle uh, that, uh, that that goes uh, to that direction but but still extremely limited and the last point simply concerning um, the effectiveness it's also been interesting dynamics i mean uh, the uh, the russian uh, side uh, the, uh, the russian officials politicians uh, uh, for for quite some time actually downplayed any effects of the of the economic sanctions and, and saying that it is negligible and so on it's been interesting to see that over a couple of last weeks you have had the uh, 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 the economics uh, minister uh, uh, the finance minister silanov as well as the prime minister medvedev coming out on the record and saying how much actually russia is is being hurt by the economic sanctions which is a totally different narrative that we heard a couple of months ago so one might also draw certain conclusions out of that and the potential further effectiveness of the sanctions on the, on the, on, on the Russian financial situation. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll take three or four questions at once um, and please introduce yourself. Uh, firstly, in the fourth row there. Hi, I'm Hossein Vastani from the BBC Persian. I understand that there is a perception that <clears throat> the long-term sanctions that were imposed on Iran over a decade led to the change of the behavior of, of the Iranian government over the nuclear program. I think if there is a lesson that uh, we can have from the Iranian experience is that the long-term sanctions had no effect on the change of, in Iran's behavior. The only thing that really changed Iran's behavior were the uh, san sanctions that were imposed on Iran in the last two years of mm -hmm. Mr. Ahmadinejad's administration. The banking and financial and all sanctions that really paralyzed Iran's economy and uh, led to, to a drop in Iran's oil revenue by more than half and the freeze of over $120 billion of Iran's asset in international banks. Uh, the sanctions that existed before only empowered the revolutionary guards in Iran because the Iranian private sector could not compete anymore in such economic conditions and the, the, the vacuum uh, that existed in, in Iran's economy was filled by revolutionary guards. But after the, 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 the intensification of international sanctions, banking and um, oil sanctions, uh, even the revolutionary guards could not anymore do any yeah. business in the international uh, community, even with Chinese or Russians. So it, it was really clear from the time that uh, the new round of sanctions were imposed on Iran that there would be a policy change in Iran and it was exactly what happened. Great, thank you. That's very interesting and, and that would seem to suggest that the West should fast forward a bit on the sanctions against Russia. Uh, there was a question here in the front row. Okay. Alan Riley, City University. I've got two points. The first, and I, I have this uh, impression from um, to be advising on sanctions, that it's not so much what the text of the sanctions says today. It is for many uh, potential investors in Russia, uh, <laughs> companies who have links or are thinking about links with Russian companies, it's the accelerator threat that whatever the, the sanctions are today, tomorrow they may be worse. And if you're thinking about making a $10 billion loan uh, to a Russian company, you may not be sanctioned today, but you feel you may be sanctioned tomorrow. And once you sink that cash in, the question is, can you get it out? Yeah. I think the example I would give of that is in, actually in relation to Gazprom and uh, South Stream. Because the problem with South Stream was an, at the end of the day, it was relying on Western finance and actually a Western company, ENI, to uh, do the deal to build the pipelines and run the operation. But ENI is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It raises finance in the United States. And the advice that their lawyers gave on sanctions would have been, well, even if... Gazprom isn't caught today, Gazprom will probably be caught tomorrow. And you can see this, and equally with Turkstream, one of my questions about the ability to uh, deliver that Turkstream yeah. at scale, they might build one or two pipelines, is again, where is the finance going to come from, and how can you do it in a way which will protect yourself from a sanctions accelerator? Yeah. It's the sanctions accelerator uh, fear, which has a massive additional footprint and impact on uh, the, the, the actual sanctions that exist. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was a question here at the front as well. 
Thank you. Yari uh, Krivoy, Belarus Digest. I wonder whether we can learn any lessons from Belarus sanctions, which have been in place for over 10 years. Uh, there are in a couple of interesting observations. So the sanctions actually did not result that much in decrease of popularity of the regime. And in 2011, uh, inflation was actually over 100% in Belarus, and it did not lead to any serious public uh, protest. So the assumption is that when the population is getting poorer, it will automatically either you know, revolt. Uh, is, uh, is, I don't think it's that uh, clear. The other point is, uh, from the Belarusian experience, it looks like there is no clear correlation between the number of uh, political prisoners and the number of people who are on the blacklist. So they are kind of, there is no correlation. There is a correlation, correlation however, between the a more assertive uh, Russian policy in the neighborhood. So when Russia started a war in Georgia, when Russia started a war in Ukraine, then more political prisoners are released. And so that uh, seems like a more effective tool. And the question is um, yeah. whether the... Uh, whether we can use the existing mechanisms uh, to uh, deal with, um, or with corrupt officials, with companies like Gazprom. Uh, there, are, uh, there is the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States, another act is called RICO. Uh, obviously, uh, we have money, anti money laundering legislation. Is it possible just to have more intensive enforcement of the existing regulation rather than coming up with you know, new ideas, sanctions, and so on? Thank you. Great. So far, there. Well, actually, that was the question. The other two are sort of more comments. So I'm going to keep going, actually, uh, before turning back to the panel. Ian Bond. Thank you very much, Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform. Uh, I'm not sure this is a question exactly, but could we have a moratorium on the use of the of the phrase off ramp? <laughs> It seems to me that every time any Western official or politician uses the phrase off-ramp, the message that is received in the Kremlin is, we are not as committed to these sanctions as you might think we are. I mean, it is a sign of weakness, and it is an in interpreted in a sign of, as a sign of weakness. The message that we ought to be giving is that this is unacceptable behavior, it's part of a pattern which started at least with Georgia in 2008. And actually, if you implement the Minsk package, you will still not be reassuring us that you can be trusted thereafter. What worries me with the talk of off-ramps is that there is an implication that if the Russians simply stop doing the things that they are doing, we will go back to business as usual. In actual fact, that seems to me to be very short-sighted indeed. It's what we did in 2008, and I fear that it gave Putin the confidence to think that a few years later, there would be very limited short-term consequences for invading Ukraine as well. So I, I would like, I mean, if there is a question, the question is, Beyond any possible implementation of the Minsk agreement, which looks pretty far-fetched in any case at the moment, what is our long-term strategy for ensuring that Russia is deterred from taking this sort of action in the former Soviet Union or anywhere else hereafter? Yeah. I mean, could you pass the microphone to the gentleman next to you? <coughs> Andrei Larionov, uh, Gate Institute, to comment. Uh, just if we look into the so-called effectiveness of sanctions in economic sense, uh, we would be very much surprised. In the first quarter of the year 2014, whether, when there were almost no sanctions, uh, capital outflow, capital outflight from Russia was about 50 billion US dollars. In the third quarter of the same year, when almost all sanctions have been implemented, uh, capital flight was roughly four times smaller. Okay, what, what it should say about the effectiveness of sanctions. Uh, in the beginning of this year, especially since mid of February, when all sanctions that we are talking about are implemented, we have seen Russian ruble appreciated about 30% and Russian stock market uh, rose again, also about 30%. So it looks like that more sanctions are being imposed on Russia. Uh, it's a kind of the, at least some of those indicators are uh, demonstrating uh, better, better positions. The other uh, comment concerning Minsk, uh, 
looks like the Minsk II was a result not of sanctions imposed on Russia, but result of nuclear blackmail that Mr. Putin was using against uh, Europe, especially against Germany and France. And that was uh, uh, some kind of effectiveness, but effectiveness of quite different policies. Yeah. And actually, we'll look in Minsk II. I don't think we should praise it from any point of view, because if you look into this agreement, this is agreement deprive Ukraine from sovereignty, from the control of international border between Ukraine and Russia. At least put its independence on the election uh, in separatist regions where uh, Ukrainian authorities or European authorities do not have any control on. And it is not only agreement between Russia and Ukraine. This agreement is being supported by the power and respect by two European superpowers. Great, thank you. Um, so a whole range of different questions. Anders, maybe you first. Do you want to respond particularly on some of these detailed points about the about sanctions, about the um, the very interesting point about the 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 sort of um, the way that private sector actors um, act, um, and and perhaps the point on the Belarus sanctions as well. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, these uh, Iranian sanctions have really developed the whole thinking about uh, sanctions. So this is uh, the dominant idea that you hear in the Treasury and State Department uh, uh, now. So trade sanctions are no good, should be avoided as far as possible. Yeah. Uh, certain are needed, dual technology, uh, defense technology there, it should be tightened on, yeah. on Russia. But no oil uh, sanctions. If uh, any sanctions on oil and gas were undertaken against Russia, that would mean that the oil price would go up. Russia would uh, possibly benefit uh, from it. Long term development, uh, yes, that can be impeded, but not uh, the short term. So they were extremely effective on Iran, but impossible for Russia? Well, for, for Iran, it was that the quantity was not uh, the same. I don't remember. Is it uh, three and a half uh, million uh, barrels a day from Iran? Something Russia is 10.7 uh, million barrels a day. So for Russia, it would be suicidal for, for the West uh, uh, to try. The financial sanctions, as you said, worked very well. And they were not applied in the same way uh, to Belarus. This is, uh, is the lesson. And indeed, Belarus doesn't look at, uh, as bad as Russia uh, does uh, today. So therefore, uh, the, the idea that Belarus should be particular uh, harm. Uh, personal sanctions, you have very different views on. They are very popular <coughs> in Russia. Alexei Navalny is now campaigning for 1,000 uh, top officials and families uh, should be given uh, uh, personal uh, sanctions. I think uh, that is a very good uh, idea. On uh, Alan Riley, why the financial sanctions are so effective is partly because they are uh, quite uh, extra legal. Uh, you have uh, the same financial regulators who are in investigators, prosecutors, and judges. We don't want that, by and large. The banks are uh, dead, uh, dead frightened, but uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, qu uh, quite effective. And uh, Andre, what you said here is uh, very much dependent on the uh, capital outflows. When uh, payments are to come up, you have $50 billion to be paid out in December. Yes, then there is more coming. There was very little schedule for for the, the third uh, quarter. You can't look on the details uh, uh, like that because the time schedule for payments uh, vary uh, greatly. And there was a massive panic in Russia in December when people realized after that you get a relief la uh, rally. Forget the uh, relief rally. This, this won't hold. What we are seeing is that money is, uh, is uh, float, uh, floating out uh, uh, of uh, the country. And indeed, uh, back to your question, uh, money laundering should be used to a much greater extent. All Russian state companies can be treated as money laundering <coughs> cases. Why was it done to Gazprom? Because it was $360 billion market value. Today, it's about $60 billion. It's such a small company one can prosecute. $360 billion is too big to prosecute. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, uh, 
Sergey or, or John, do you want to come in? I want to take yeah. another round of questions. Yeah. May, may, may I have to to three short comments? Three short comments. We have missed one of your initial questions about China and its so-called Russian pivot to Asia. Russian authorities believed that could raise finance from China. China said no. So China can invest in the projects that are beneficial to China. China is ready to invest in Russian natural resources, in infrastructure China promoted like New Silk Way, but China does not provide access to capital to all Russian borrowers. So, and all plays with uh, this Asian infrastructure, AIB and so on, it's yeah. Chinese play, it's not Russian play. Yeah. So Russia is just junior partner and it's not uh, against sanctions so, so on. Uh, on Belarus question, very, very good question. And that there is a very nice example. Approximately a couple of months ago, uh, Spain started to impose its existing legislation and checking accounts of Russians who held assets in this country just tax authority, tax evasion. You have property, you have money into your accounts, please declare your, state, your tax statement, your tax returns. Show us that you have paid taxes. Many of Russians <coughs> refused to defend their accounts. And they just say, okay, take, the, take those money. If, if you learn about uh, this Spanish example, Spanish case, it would be nice if you do it in, uh, in the whole Europe and the United States. I, I wonder, is it possible to do against companies? It's much more difficult, but they, okay, against individuals, much easier. Andre, am I right? You were asking about the first quarter of 2014. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. The problem, the problem. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's, that's why I want to answer your question. First, first quarter, first quarter, we should not forget first quarter of 2014 was annexation of Crimea. And, and, uh, and that was, that's why the capital outflow was statistically $50 billion. For example, many Russian banks were, uh, were afraid of freezing of assets. And as I know, Gazprom Bank in the, alone has, has parked $10 billion in central bank accounts. That's so, my exact point. That was my exact point. That was yeah. Exactly scared, but not sanctioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were scared of potential sanctions. And that's why statistically it's capital outflow. But it was, uh, th th that uh, Gazprom Bank is one of crony banks, we know this. I owe Ian an answer mm -hmm. very quickly, if I could just make yeah. four quick yeah. points to Ian. One, uh, President Obama was here, probably not far from this room uh, uh, last year, and made a very strong statement of absolute solidarity and commitment to Article 5, I imagine, uh, this president was probably at his side when he made that statement. Uh, first, on terms of our long-term uh, commitment and, and to deter the Russians. Second is all the defense uh, measures that we've taken together as an alliance and as the United States, uh, uh, troop presences and rotations and exercises and air policing and whatnot. Third, the most important way, I think, the most effective way to, 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 to deter Russia is for Ukraine to succeed. There was a lot of discussion about that. Successful Ukraine resolve some of the frozen conflicts, Moldova to succeed, uh, Georgia to succeed, that very important way to, to deter. The off-ramp term maybe is not such an elegant term, but this, it's designed to, to de demonstrate that the, the, that the policy is calibrated toward his behavior. If we're going to say that, you know, we have sanctions until they become Switzerland, well, that's not a very, that doesn't give him much of an incentive to do anything. The idea is that you have, if his behavior improves, then the, then the, the sanctions will be recalibrated. Is that, that the term is designed to create a, an interaction between his behavior and, and the response. Great. Uh, we're, we're, running out, we're running out of time, so I, I, I just want to squeeze in a few more questions, um, uh, if, if I can. Uh, so starting with Alia Olam at the back. My name is uh, Ola Olyum, European External Action Service. Just a short comment. I think one of the most effective sanctions that have been applied, that have amplified the other sanctions, both towards Russia and Iran, hasn't been mentioned. This is perhaps not usually seen as a kind of formal sanction, but that is the Saudi Arabian decision to go for low oil prices. And we know that they're able to maintain that for some years because of their foreign exchange reserves. There is a boomerang effect, of course, on the new oil and gas uh, exploration in, in the United States, as we know. But um, shouldn't we think also in terms of uh, the Saudi Arabians as a partner uh, in the political objectives that we're seeking to obtain with the sanctions? Thank you. Interesting. Uh, Damon Wilson. Thank you very much. Uh, John, while you might, might have been criticized for off-ramps, I want to thank you for using reinforcement to stress deterrence <laughs> rather than reassurance uh, as a strategy. Just a quick question about um, 
what happens if we see uh, the blatant collapse of Minsk II, if we see the return to outright uh, uh, brazen fighting in the East? Um, for those who negotiated Minsk, shouldn't they be invested in its success by preparing in advance the consequences of violating that and communicating that to, to Putin in advance, sanctions and otherwise? Great. And then Celeste Wander and Mike McFall, and then we're going to have to close it out, I'm afraid. At the front, right at the front. Hi, just quickly, I just want to reinforce some points that John made to clarify a couple things. One is, because there seems to be confusion, the sanctions, sanctions that we've imposed on Russia are not part of a larger Russia strategy. They are because specifically of Russia's actions in Ukraine, and they are tied to that action. And that's why it's tied to achieving the implementation of Minsk, 2014 Minsk, and then the implementation uh, agreement of 2015. So you may argue, one may want to argue, that sanctions policy should be part of a broader strategy, and that's fine to argue it. But don't confuse the issue by saying sanctions shouldn't be listed until Russia becomes uh, something else. That's an interesting idea, but that's not why they were imposed, and that was not our agreement with Europe. And we have to keep that unity and clarity and targeting of, uh, of the purpose. The second point is about uh, Minsk implementation plan, because I've heard this the last couple of days. The Minsk implementation plan, if fully implemented, returns total territorial integrity of, uh, and sovereignty of the Donbass to Ukraine. It includes free and fair elections under Ukrainian law with international monitoring in order to elect local representatives who then can negotiate with the central government. It's exactly to get out of the situation that Ukraine finds itself in right now. And it returns control of the international border to Ukraine with international monitoring. And it requires the withdrawal of all foreign fighters, illegal armed groups, and all equipment that has flown, flowed into eastern Ukraine illegally. So if Minsk were implemented, then we would achieve the objective relative to the Donbass that we've been trying so hard to achieve. A lot of the comments here have been about, well, if it does, if it doesn't happen, you can't lift sanctions. Correct. And that's our policy. If Minsk is not implemented, the sanctions will not be lifted. Great. Thank you. And then next to you, Mike McFall. So they won't be lifted forever, it sounds like to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, th this is a great panel, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, the, the statistic of many that jumped out at me, and I want to make sure I understood it. Sergey, you said that half of all Russian industrial production today is in the military industrial complex. Manufacturing. Manufacturing, Manufacturing. right. Well, this leads me to a, a broader question. Uh, you know, whether it was driven by sanctions or it was Putin's policy or not, but the, 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 the secondary or unintended consequences of, of being in a war effort yeah. leading to what sounds like very Soviet-style yeah. uh, economic policies. Could you guys say a little bit about what has happened to the debate or progress uh, about structural reforms in Russia, and is that perhaps in the long run, another unintended positive consequence of the, the situation you're in now, that they're not doing these things and down the road we will see further deterioration of the economy in Russia. Great, thank you. Um, so, Sergei, do you want to answer precisely that and any other um, final thoughts you have? But if you could be brief, okay, that'd, that'd be, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. well, well, okay, Mark, uh, it's, uh, let's say that uh, all military uh, investment and change in military production were uh, developed in 2000. 10, 2011, and accepted by that time. So it's not the result of Ukrainian conflict, and not it's sooner because of Georgian war. And uh, the, the, the financing of the military program will go up until 2020, and uh, further until 2025. Russian government invests heavily, uh, not only in procurement, but in uh, remoder modernization in equipment in military companies. And of course, this increases the weight of the military complex in the Russian economy. Debates on structural reforms Better to say there is no debates. There, is, there, is no, there, there are ideas, of course, they are on the table, but all of ideas, that are, they are frozen. And the only one real action in structural reforms is more state involvement. Uh, if you read on the very recent news uh, about how Russia debates its forecast for 2016 and 17, uh, even such a liberal as Alexei Ulukaev, who is Minister of Economy, he relies only upon state financing. 
He says we have to use more of national welfare fund. We have to uh, remove budgetary rule. We have to increase budget deficit. So he said there is no any hope for private investment. And I believe that any productive structural reforms, they may rely only on private investment, not on the government. Great. Um, Anders, any final thoughts from you? Briefly, if you can. Yeah, I, I can add here on the military industrial complex. Uh, you, uh, out of Ukraine's exports to Russia in 2013, 34% was machinery, read military equipment. So the Russian military industrial complex is really a Soviet military industrial complex, of which the Ukrainian armament industry is still a part. And this will hit Ukraine, but it will also hit Russia. Um, John? Quick thought on defense. One thing you'll be hearing more about uh, in the next uh, months and, and, and years ahead Czechs have started an effort in the alliance, and, and, and we feel strong that it's, that it's an important one, is to reduce the dependence of former uh, Soviet and former Warsaw Pact countries on uh, Russia's military uh, uh, resupply. So you'll, see, you'll hear more about that, and uh, we'll be looking for ideas on how to do that. Great. Thank you. And uh, finally, to you, Henrik. Uh, just two points. Uh, first, uh, there was also the question about the, uh, uh, the Consequences that if, uh, if if the Minsk process fails, and um, uh, just to say that uh, when uh, when the leaders decided that the uh, sanctions are going to be rolled out and, and deployed against Russia uh, in uh, in July last year, then. Uh, we were quite soon ready uh, to do that, basically within 24 hours. Why? Because we had preparing for that for about half a year. I mean, obviously, uh, there is a constant preparation ongoing in order to foresee any kind of uh, potential development, and that could include the new layers, adding new layers of sanctions, but it equally could include also rolling back the existing sanctions. So this is already, it, it's part of the system, and, 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 and we are definitely looking into that. But of course, it is up to the, to the political leaders to, uh, to take the decision uh, how to how to go forward and, and what kind of um, uh, what kind of policy are we going to apply? Perhaps the last last point I I, I thought maybe uh, a good one to end. I mean, uh, Ian's question was about how can we avoid not uh, going back to the to the business as usual, and. Um, the, um, the president of the, of the European Commission, Jacques-Claude Juncker, when he, um, when, he, when he started with this commission about six months ago, uh, his narrative that he used was, this time it's different. Now, I very much hope that we can use the same narrative on that question as well. Great. Thank you very much for being brief. Um, apologies to those of you whose questions I couldn't take. Um, apologies for eating into your coffee break. Um, uh, thank you very much for taking part in what I think was a very granular discussion with actually some very interesting policy implications. I'm not sure that we um, have a definitive answer to the question of whether sanctions are a sword or a boomerang, but I look forward to coming back to the Lennart Mary conference in 2025 um, to uh, answer it definitively. Thank you very much. Thank you.